This is Catherine Cespedes, and you are listening to Yogini from the Block, where we talk about taking spiritual practices and spiritual principles off of the yoga mat and into our real lives. You can listen to this bi-weekly podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play Music, and anywhere that you catch your podcasts. Hello, and you are here for episode 14 titled, Make Your Decision, subtitled, Match the Frequency of Your Desires. So today is a very, very, very special podcast. I have a special guest here with us. Um, and John, of course, my wonderful producer is here. Hey, happy generic time of the day. <laughs> And our special guest is Kevin Graham, who is a PhD candidate, and he's also um, he's also working at Cornell University. Now, with all those wonderful things that he has done in his life, another thing that I would like to mention is that uh, Kevin and I are a couple. So he is my boyfriend, and he is here to have a conversation about making decisions. So thank you, Kevin. Thank you for being here and for saying yes. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. <laughs> okay, so one of the main reasons why I thought this would be a great topic to talk about, which, by the way, we had to talk about for a really long time to come to a decision, and it's because I feel like your decision-making skills up to this point, with all that you have done, are just so, like, you have, you have a... Um, you have a process and I have my own process and my process has a lot to do with gut instincts and what I feel is right for me and really discovering who I am. And when we talk, it's you do the same thing, but your vocabulary and your verbiage in how you do that is completely different, which is why I wanted to talk to you about this. So I'm going to open up the floor to you um, wherever you want to start on this. Uh, my question would really be so that we can begin um, is how did you know like how did you know that you wanted to take this leap into even starting your phd even becoming a candidate okay uh, thank you for the question and <laughs> your description of my decision making process actually made me laugh it was a very sweet way of saying ah you um are very structured in your decision making uh and perhaps overly detailed and you are right. We had to make a decision about making decisions um, and even preparing to talk about this because I, I, I thrive off details and sort of rationale and knowing. Um, so with regards to my professional or even academic journey, I tend to blend intuition meets a basic level of what I call sensibility. So I follow my intuition, yes, that's the basis for everything in life. It's, it's the life force behind, behind my decision-making process. Nonetheless, I temper it with this, this idea of what makes the most sense while simultaneously interrogating my direction. Where am I going? Um, I'm a huge fan of Marcus Aurelius. Uh, he's a philosopher, sort of the, for, the forefather of Stoicism. And he puts it that, a philosopher's life, or rather their goal in life is to live an examined life. So I tend to examine my decision. Um, and, and I think what you shared earlier about the differences in, in our decision and what I've been learning from you is this thing called intuition. So I think you have a beautiful science as well behind the way in which you make decisions. So I too am learning from the way, <laughs> from the way that you make your decisions. Thank you. Um, so we, we do do this thing where we go back and forth and I'm like, well, this, is, this just doesn't feel right. And I can't tell. <laughs> I can't tell my significant other why I don't want to do a thing or why I do want to go in a direction. It just feels right for me. And his decision making process is more of what does it what does what does the outcome look like? What would it look like if I went uh, <clears throat> path A and what would it look like to go down path B? Which which I think is very logical and very, very beautiful. And neither one is right and neither one is wrong. It's just a way to come to a decision, to, to come to a, a choice. And what I notice is that a lot of the times in my experience, making a decision becomes a huge halt 
like stop the presses. This is a big decision right here. When honestly, it, it, it isn't any bigger than what toothpaste you're going to use. Why? Because the decision that you make is ultimately going to lead you in the direction in which you you see yourself in the right. bigger picture. So I think one thing that I do want to mention is that in making a decision, we need to have the larger picture at hand first, right? Would you would you agree with that? Or is that something that you don't agree with? No, I, I agree with that. I'll say, I'll expound for a bit. So one of my favorite quotes is, life is but the sum of the decisions that we make. So earlier you asked, what, what sort of went into my process for pursuing my particular educational uh, path? Uh, PhD is one of the most abandoned degrees that one can pursue. It takes about roughly five to six years of your life. And it is, for all intents and purposes, a big decision. One doesn't happen to find themselves on this particular academic path. So for me, that was a moment of pause. So I love the fact that you, you, you sort of primed this with, Certain decisions in life require pause. So I was roughly 25 at the time and I had finished with my master's one year into my career and I reached this pause and I said, okay, what's next? Remember living the examined life. So I thought, well, what's next for me? And I thought about the work that I wanted to do. I thought about my contributions that I wanted to make legacy versus capital. At least that's how I always put it. Do I want to invest in spending my time pursuing monetary capital, or do I want to lead a leg, leave a legacy? And for me, legacy is impacting lives. Uh, And then I had this novel thought, well, does it have to be an either or? By the way, you do that a lot. (laughs) When we talk, you always say to me, in making decisions, you said, well, does it need to be an either or? Because I remember I did a very black and white thing and you stopped me beautifully and you say, well, does it need to be an either or? So at that point in my life, um, thankfully, Uh, By some spirit of intuition, I stopped myself and I said, well, do I need to make a decision so black and white? Can I have this blended thing where I do legacy, I impact lives? So that's one thing that I wanted to do. And that's one thing that led to me pursuing um, a PhD, particularly in this field, as well as the work that I do. One, impacting lives. That that was integral to my decision-making process. Uh, and, And that was how I conceptualized this thing of legacy. Um, so the other part is that I mentioned earlier, capital. And that was my, my do it needs to be that black and white. Because oftentimes we often think of, or me, I often think of decisions as it relates to career as, okay, you can either impact people's lives or you can be rich. And what I'm learning is that uh, you, can do, you can do both. You can do really satisfying work that impacts people's lives while simultaneously you can sort of have have the ability to grow monetarily as well. Okay. So, yeah, go ahead. So I, I really, I really like the fact that you brought up the whole black, black and white. How, um, in my experience, I was like, well, it's got to be this way or this way. Either I'm going to be a paralegal, or I'm going to be a yoga teacher. Or either I'm going to be in New mm-hmm. York City, or I'm going to move across the country. And those were decisions that I had to make. <laughs> To come to where I am today in the understanding that you can have a balance of both things. You can have, I I could have, right, been a paralegal Mm -hmm. who worked as a yoga instructor part-time. I could have done that. Or vice versa. I could have been a full-time yoga yoga instructor with a part-time paralegal profession. (laughs) That could have been a thing. And the reason why it was so nerve-wracking to begin with was because I was making myself make hard decisions without trying to with without looking at the the middle portion the way i see it there is like there's this this one big circle which encompasses the entire degree of this one decision and then on the other hand there is this other circle that encompasses all the decisions and all the life experiences that you would gain from this other decision right it's a or b but then when you merge Mm -hmm. them together right you create this um what do they call it you create this this piece in the middle and mm-hmm. that piece is what merges both life experiences is the A and the B. And so this is what I look for when I'm making a decision now. I'm like, what can I do that kind of marries those two decisions? It's not about those two decisions. It's about this feeling right here, this in the center where both of these meet this quote unquote gray 
area is really what I want to live. It's really what I want to um, create in my life experience. So how can I create that? And that seems for me a lot easier to navigate and to swallow instead of saying, I've got to let go of this and I've got to pursue that and hurting myself in either direction. And when I look at the center, I'm like, oh, I can have both. I think I'm going to be okay. I like this aspect. I like these pieces that come in the gray area. And I don't feel like I'm losing anything. I don't feel like, I don't feel like there is this loss, right? This loss mm -hmm. for me. Like, oh my goodness, I took route B. I wonder what would have happened if I would have taken route A, right? And, and again, living in examined life, which here uh, John and I have talked about it, it being um, taking inventory, of of our experiences taking inventory of our day taking inventory of our feelings taking inventory of the life that we led not just every birthday right or every every uh -huh. 10 years but really looking at it on a daily basis like today was a good day or today was not a such a good day or the past week has not been such a good week what is happening here is there anything that i even need to change here what decision am i going to make either and very very quickly Not making a decision is also a decision. Like when you when you come to that crossroad and you're like, I'm just not going to do anything right now. And you decide not to do anything. Just recognize that not making a decision is the biggest decision because you are deciding not to do anything. And if you decide not to chase your dreams, you have decided not to chase your dreams. And I only say that because for a long time I was so stuck on what decision I was going to make. I decided not to do anything at all. And so I paused my own growth. I paused my own, my own path because I said, let me just not do anything because I'm too afraid to take either, either direction right now. Um, so that's, that's one space in career. But also, I want you to talk a little bit about how you kind of just kept going. It wasn't like when you got to, um, to Nazareth, uh, we went to Nazareth College together in Rochester. So it's not when you got to Naz, you were like, I'm going to go for my PhD in 2000, whatever year you came in. Sorry, I don't have it off the top of my head. But that year, <laughs> you didn't decide I'm going to go for my PhD. There was, there was a, I'm going to go for my bachelor's. And then? Okay, so a couple of things. And I have a question for you as well. So I'm not going to, I'm going to hand it back with a question. <laughs> um, I, I love what you said earlier about this idea of, of not making the decision is a decision. So I live in the world of social justice, right? And we have this, this notion, this idea of silence is consent. And, and I frame that as if you don't make a decision, you are indeed making a decision. There's a reality that comes that manifests itself from lack thereof of a decision. Um, now, so the question that you ask about My, my trajectory. Yes, we went to the college together, known as the Heart of Excellence. Um, and while, while I was there, I've always known, I've always had this, this resonating voice. It was quite salient uh, that whatever I do, I will climb to the zenith. I will, I will seek to ascend. It has always been sort of a silent, a silent mantra. Um, and I've heard other people speak of this in terms of I've always known that I was meant to do something great. And for me, I, I wouldn't necessarily categorize it as something something great. For me, I would I would categorize it as this idea of perpetual growth. So when I was there and and at, at NAS, I had this feeling, and from um, from many people. Um, and I work with the student population. So a lot of times I hear students say, well, you know, Mr. Graham, I feel like I'm meant to do something great. I'm meant to do something greater. And I, I resonate with that, with that, that, that call, that feeling that many people have. Now, the decision in that is, do I listen to it or do I ignore it? And or do I succumb to social norms? Because we live in a society that's filled with checkpoints. By 30, ideally, you'd have your life together. By 25, you're steering the boat of your life in a particular direction. And I always say to people, well, pause. What, what has always been there? 
What has always been there? What has always been calling out to you? What are you good at doing? What would you do for free? Uh, or, or, or what do you do in your spare time that brings you joy? For me at the time, it was being within the environment, within the context of higher education. That was a huge, that was a huge piece that at the time, you can see, I love the environment. So while I was, while I was an undergrad, I knew I wanted to continue my education. I had the energy for it. Um, for some people, it wasn't practical. For me, I wanted to continue. So I transitioned to a PhD program by way of listening to that voice, by way of not shutting off or turning away from that inner ambition that says continue to go. So my decision was to simply listen to myself and listen to what was there. So now my question for you, because I think what you said earlier was so fantastic, and I would love it if you can expound, because I think there's something here for me to learn, in that you, you shared about your decision-making process and this idea of the black and white, and really and truly you finding a system that worked for you. And decision is something that I think I struggled with at some point in my life, and then I came to it. Right. How did you come to that space of your decision making process? Was there a pivotal moment or was it you constantly refining yourself or some other thing that I'm not thinking of in this moment? So it, I wish I could say there was an aha moment because those are amazing. But this was not an aha moment. This was a uh, trial and error. This was a series of years of not making any decisions at all and kind of just following the norm and doing what I thought I was supposed to do right after college, um, which I have shared. I, after college, I started working at a law firm and then I kind of just continued following that, that lifestyle. I knew that I had to climb the corporate ladder. I knew that each job that I took, I wanted a bigger pay raise. So I tried that and that didn't work for me. And then I drastically shifted from that to, um, to becoming a yoga instructor and just deciding that that's what I was going to do. I was like, that's going to be my thing and forcing it for that to be my thing. And it worked for a while. I enjoy doing yoga. I, this is Yogini from the block podcast, but it wasn't about the actual practice, the physical practice. There was something else that opened up for me. So I say that yoga is a gateway to spirituality. You know, it, it really opened up those doors in, in, in wanting In my desire to find out what else is there. In me Mm -hmm. sitting on my my fire escape in the Bronx and thinking there's got to be more to this. The sky is so big. Why am I stuck to this fire escape? And really questioning myself. So there was a lot of internal work, which I have been sharing little by little. Um, what I've done and there was there was trial and error it was really like that just didn't work for me this doesn't work for me so really fine-tuning like you said fine-tuning what does work for me to the point where I have um, we were talking about it the other night where I I um, I was in my room and I was like I created like I created exactly the life that I wanted when I got here I moved across the country with five boxes I had nothing and fast forward to today and I have my own place. I have a car. I have a job. I have a career that I'm starting. And I wouldn't have known that that was going to come out. But I knew when I got here, there was this, just like you, there was this voice. And it said, everything is okay. Like, you are fine. You are, it's okay. You're okay. You can take care of yourself. And and this, um, which is funny that I'm going to bring it up because um, going through classes isn't always <laughs> as fun in every single moment but it is it is um it is beautiful to awaken to right because when i first started uh roots emerson reading emerson's essay on self-reliance really shook me up and had me just peeved at the world and really upset at emerson like who how dare you Emerson. And as I got through the class, I was like, I see what you're saying. And really, it was that self-reliance in in me that I knew that I could do it. So I started deciding what what decision making process is best for me. 
So for a long time, I did nothing. And then I was like, I'm just going to follow every whim, <laughs> walk into every crystal shop, buy every single set of affirmation cards. <laughs> Everything that calls to me, I'm just going to do it and live on gut, like gut instincts. And then there came this in between where it's it's creating the bigger picture and then really looking at what decision is leading me closer to that bigger goal that I do have mm-hmm. for me. And, and it's funny that I don't think I've ever actually explained it in, um, in a linear fashion to me. It's like, yeah, well I did this and then I did that. And of course this is what happens. So <laughs> it, it has been a trial and error. And, and what I want to bring up is that you said, you know, what would you do for free and what do you do on your spare time? And I think that yes. is, that's very big. That's very, very big. Um, mm-hmm. Because I, I, to the people that I love, I would say, what do you like to do? And I would get it. I would get back. I don't know. I'm not good at anything. And so I'd be like, okay. And this is, I'm not telling you to do this. This is not the way to go. So then I would be like, okay, so you're not good at anything. Now what? <laughs> now what? <laughs> right? And I would do that because I knew that there was so many things that these people were good at. This one person that I loved to death, I was like, you're so good at so many things, so many things. So it's not only about capitalizing on it. It's really enjoying what that means. And right now I'm reading, um, I am reading You Are a Badass at Making Money. And there is this one story where um, Jen Sincero talks about this woman named Kathy who is 52 years old. And what Kathy did was that she um, she has this self, her own self mantra. And she basically says, I am a genius at making money. Anything that I do, I just I make I make so much money. It just keeps flowing in. So what Kathy does is that she starts at this financial firm and she starts at the very, very bottom level. And she makes her way up and she ends up retiring at the age of 40, right? So this is very young to retire. She ends up retiring. And then once she retires, what she decides to do is that she decides to garden in her own backyard. And what ends up happening is that Kathy's mantra, I'm really good at making money. She turns that garden into basically a flower shop. She didn't want to. That wasn't like her intention. I'm not going to say she didn't want to. Because she ended up doing it, so she must have wanted to, right? She made a decision. Right. But that wasn't that wasn't her her idea. She knew she could make money. She had retired. She was well off. And she was doing something that she loved. And she was actually doing it for free for a while until she was like, wait a minute. I can sell these. I can make some money out of it. So not only is she comfortable, retired, mm-hmm. now she's making this additional money from something that she loves. So... Once again, um, just bringing up what brings up a fire in you, like what even when no one else says that you can do this, like right now there are there are so many um, self self help books, so many um, coaches, so many. There's so many. There are a lot. There's and when I started doing yoga, that was the same thing. And somehow I managed to pay my bills in the Bronx, <laughs> living in New York City. Like it's possible when you know that it's possible. And um, so we talked about we talked about career. We talked about your a, a portion of your journey to your PhD process. Um, so we haven't talked about the fact that when you got here, you got here at the age of thirteen. Twelve. You were twelve. So you were 12 years old when you moved here from? Uh, Georgetown guy in a small country in South America. Right. So we didn't even talk about that portion, the fact that you came to a country that you really knew nothing about other than what you saw on TV. And yet here you are standing today on your way to get your PhD. So there is no limit to what you can what you can have. And what I notice and when I talk about when I talk to you, you have a completely different mindset than a lot of individuals that I've spoken to. You know, like I'm just going to be very, very clear here. So in the realm of love and relationships, um, talking to Kevin was completely different because he was on a different like obviously he was on a different frequency from the other individuals that you know i had been talking to and trying to figure out like can this work can we make this happen and here is what kevin would call the caveat to this relationship is that he lives in new york and i live in california and so this relationship was clearly a decision that we both made (laughs) 
Yes, very much so. Right. So there, the reason why I bring this up is because um, when it comes to when it comes to life, a lot of what I wanted to know anyway was how do I make money? How do I find real love? And how do I have a balanced life? All in one. Like mm-hmm. be super everything. And in talking to you, you just take everything in stride. Like you're just very calm about things. Like mm-hmm. there could be a fire in your office and you're like, all right, guys, make sure you take your keys. <laughs> Do you have your wallet? And, um, oh, let me just call my girl. Make sure that she knows that I'm okay. Cause she probably started in the news. <laughs> <laughs> so how do you how do you in those times that you're making decisions that you don't have time to really sit down and contemplate and and be in this meditative state and burn some sage how do you make those decisions when it really matters when when your heart is racing when things don't seem like they're going according to plan okay I'll tackle several things because I, I love I love the couple of things that you shared because you weaved it in beautifully. So one, yes, being in uh, this relationship with you, and I'm smiling as I'm saying this, uh, being in this relationship with you was a decision. One of my best decisions that I've made in life today. Yes, I choose to love you over the 2,759.6 miles between <laughs> uh, New York State and San Diego, California. Um, how do I make decisions? especially when there are decisions that uh, would definitely make individuals, they're tense decisions. They're decisions under stress. They're not the most calm things that come to you in the middle of meditation. Um, for me, it's, it's knowing, knowing your true north. There's, there's saying that the truth remains consistent, right? I always try to find the truth in, what, in, in what's in front of me. So when I initially came into, because you mentioned earlier, when I initially came into the United States uh, as, as an immigrant in 2001. The truth that was in front of me was I had to learn a system. I had to learn what, how life flows within the United States, what means success here, and what, did, what role did I want to play in, in this very fast-paced and advanced country. Uh, and my true north, even... In, while I was in Guyana, was working with people. I've always wanted to help people do something. So I was a social work major, and the definition that I went by with, with regards to social work or doing any work in the field of humanities is helping people to help themselves. I knew that that was my work to do, and I knew that innately I traveled there. Innately. Uh, I recently um, did a TED Talk, and... When I got off the stage, I said to my grandmother nervously, I said, how did I do? And her response to me was, well, we're not surprised. My grand, my, your grandfather and I were not surprised. You've always been this way. She gave the example of when I was, and you were there for this example, uh, when she shared, you know, Kevin, he would leave the house with an umbrella and on a rainy day, he would come back without it. Um, it, As a child, not even as a child, as a teenager, I would always give. Um, and, and I love the saying that, you know, no one would remember the Good Samaritan if you didn't have something to give. So much of the decisions that I've made in my life um, were very deliberate and intentional with regards to curating and finding that thing to give. How did I want to help people? People always need help. There's, there, there's multiplicity, innumerable ways in which people need help. Think about it. Um, Nonetheless, what was, as you would say, this is a quote from you, language that I picked up from you, what is my work? By the way, I pick up a lot of language from you, a lot, a lot of language from you, because my, my lens could be very sort of structured, and I love your lens. So in explaining my decision-making process, it's really and truly staying in alignment with my true north. And I'll share this. So when I'm working with, with students, Right. And they're at that point that you just mentioned of, I don't know what to do. Right. I don't know what to do in my life. Sometimes this happens senior year. Sometimes this happened in graduate school. Hell, this could even happen in the middle of you pursuing your PhD. Um, so I, I always give the example. What would you do? Right. So think about this. What would you do? Right. If money wasn't an issue. So you're already rich. Right. So one 
element is that you're rich. The second element is you would do this thing without fail. So success is guaranteed, right? The third aspect of it, you're having fun. You naturally have fun. So what would you do if money wasn't an issue and your success was guaranteed and you would simply have fun with it? What would that thing be? You know what I've discovered? So I'm a social scientist. So I, I only ask questions and do things if I have the ability. It's, it's sad. But if I have the ability to collect some, some measure of data. And you know what I found across the sample? It doesn't matter. Across institutions. Oftentimes, the thing that that individual would say, I would do this, is either something that they're already doing that's a hobby that they don't think it's practical to make a living off of, right? Or it's a dream. And what I've noticed, interestingly, is that dream is oftentimes tied to a skill set that they already have. I've, I've always wanted to be an actor. I've always wanted to be a singer. And then when you look, I'm like, oh, but you're already singing there. You're already part of this club. But I don't think I'm good enough. So then they make these very practical decisions. And, and interestingly as well, many times these individuals have these hobbies and these skill sets, but their main vocation, i.e. major, i.e. Op- um, occupation, is in something that is the furthest, and I mean galaxies away. Like, like I'll find someone who's interested in, in singing or acting, but they're a finance major. So, but when I speak to them, they're interested in this thing. I oftentimes wonder, and I, and I offer this to them, what would your life look like if you functioned with the mindset and the perspective that I'm going to be taking care of financially, I'm already having fun because I always say, are you having fun doing that? Yes. And my success is guaranteed. What if you were to function in that perspective and simply pursue the thing that is within you, your innate calling? And sometimes people say, wow, that's interesting. And in the very rare and, and what I mean rare occasion, I'll find someone who believes in that enough isn't that interesting? Someone who believes in something that's in them enough to take that leap and say, okay, you know what? I'll look into that some more and perhaps, perhaps I'll jump at a 50% rate in that direction. So to wrap it all in one nice little gift here um, or bundle, my decision-making process in moments of of even indecision, in moments of turmoil, in moments of frustration, in moments of confusion is to breathe and find alignment with my true north. What is is there? What has always been there? What has been consistent? And then I make my decisions based off of that. That's one of the key factors. So, yeah. Okay, so... What you're so good at doing is just (laughs) being in the moment, just really being in the moment. And it's almost like a it's it's almost like an instant meditation. Like I have been (laughs) I've been with you at the store and I'm like panicking for whatever randomness. And you're like, take your time. It's not that big a deal. And so I'm now I'm taking my time and I'm being more present. Nothing has changed. The time hasn't somehow, you know, changed from four o'clock where you're supposed to be there. It's three fifty nine right now to to five o'clock. But all of a sudden, it's OK. It's all right. Like it's at this point, we've already accepted we're going to be running late or we've accepted that we're not going to do this or we it's it's a, it's being in the present moment, accepting. Mm-hmm. And then kind of just flowing from there like just moving from that space like it's it's okay because i don't know if you ever realized that when you start making decisions out of um hysteria or you're like frantic or you're like pure anxiety like nothing works out like i've tried to paint my nails during anxiety and it's a disaster it's disgusting so i i i couldn't imagine i couldn't imagine making a decision or really leave, leading my life um, in in that energy because it's not very stable energy like I can't concentrate I can't breathe for me mm-hmm. so really taking that deep breath recentering and coming into alignment changes everything 
So I just want to kind of summarize um, what we've discussed here today. Is there anything else that you want to leave us with? Or um, just just one thought, one thought, because mm-hmm. you're slow. And with with you, I too admire your decision making process. And I, I oftentimes say to you, be like the river that you are and flow. Because th- there's one thing I admire about you so much. You are an indomitable force, woman. And I, I, think, I think you just flow so well. So a lot of times what you perceive, perception is a thing, isn't it? A lot of times what you perceive as you running around, I see it as you flowing. So one thing that you've helped me with is to simply go with the flow. Because I understand my decision-making process can be very detailed and rigid in in times. And I see you flow through difficult things with smile and ease and laughter and and, and fun. Um, And the social scientist in me wants to almost pay attention to how much I laugh and flow when I'm with you versus when I'm in the supermarket Myself moving through the aisles strategically and in a detailed fashion with my list. <laughs> so something as simple as the supermarket. I think when I'm with you, we flow through the supermarket. And I, I don't know why that's the example, but that's the example right now. I think when I'm by myself, I know my spot. I'll start in the vegetable aisle and then I'll go get the bread. The peanut butter is in, in aisle 12B, so I'll go get that last. But with you, it's just we get everything done. Um and decisions just come easier. So I think they're very, I'll end on this. I think there's so many ways in which to make decisions. There's so, so, so many ways in which to make decisions. And I will sort of reiterate the point that life is but the sum of decisions that we make because on the, on, on a decision is like that matrix scene, red pill, blue pill. If I go left, my outlook, my life, my reality is different. If I write, that's different. Robert Frost in his poem, Two Paths, wrote about this. Um, and, and if you look back in, in, in history, you'll see very many things about decision. It's such an important thing. Um, and I think the beauty lies in, in the gray. I can't believe I just said that. But yes, a very structured and, and rigid and... And to-do list, if I can turn the board, you'll see my to-do list it said the gray. And that's one thing that I've learned from you is, is how to live in, in some instances, live in the gray. Hold on, wait for the contradiction, right? Intentionally. So with regards to making decision, I think my decision-making process is still evolving. So, so thank you for that, love. Thank you. And... Thank you for coming here. I know that you have a lot on your to-do list <laughs> and I know that you have a lot of students to talk to and I appreciate your time, your effort. If you are listening, if there's one thing that you take away from this is go ahead and make that decision that you've been thinking about and stand by it and I promise you everything will be okay as long as you're doing it with love and with light. Thank you so much for sharing your time and that is all for today. <laughs>